So welcome to Population Genetics Lesson 2, uh, Take 2. Um, today I'm going to be talking about <laughs> the mcdonald Kreitman test for selection. Uh, last week we talked about the India statistics. Um, uh, so in general, we're, we're talking a lot about test for selection and may continue to do that over the next couple of weeks. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, and so uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this test for selection. I do recommend that if you are going to um, use this test extensively in your own research that you um, read up a little bit about kind of the mathematical machinery behind this test and um, kind of a more complete justification. I want to introduce this as something you can put in your toolbox and have a conceptual understanding of, um, but I'm not going to make you an expert in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so last time we talked about the uh, DNDS statistic. Um, DNDS is great because it's robust to you know, population demographic history um, and a lot of other confounders. Um, and it only requires divergence data. Um, but you're often likely to miss positive selection when you use DNDS. Um, your DNDS statistic is very unlikely to be greater than one, um, except in extreme cases of really frequent recurrent positive selection on gene. Um, and that selection is often likely to be masked by pure kind of selection. Um, and so um, you can try to interpret different thresholds other than one as being positive selection, but there's no really rigorous way to do that. And so um, you might want a, a kind of more sensitive test for selection. Um, and so the McDonald Kreitman test is um, one of those. Uh, it's much more likely to pick up positive selection on a gene. Um, but it does require both polymorphism and substitution data. Right? So you're going to need to look at within population variation, which is polymorphism. And then substitution data can be fixed differences between different species. Right? And so the intuition behind this test is that polymorphism is recent, so that uh, selection had not had time to act. Um, where at least there's kind of two justifications I've heard of. Um, you know, people explain the NK test to me is one that uh, recent polymorphism will not yet have uh, felt the effects of selection, um, but also the idea that really strongly positively select alleles will go to fixation so rapidly that you won't ever see them among your polymorphisms, or you're unlikely to see them among your polymorphisms. And so polymorphism essentially is not showing the effect of selection. And so if you look at essentially your synonymous to non-synonymous polymorphisms, they are something of a null expectation against which you can look at your fixed differences. And so we're, we're doing something similar to, the, to DNDS, except now we have a null expectation based on polymorphism. And um, the quantities that you're generally going to calculate here are going to be um, essentially just the number of polymorphisms that are synonymous and non-synonymous and the number of fixed differences that are synonymous and non-synonymous. And you don't actually have to do that relative to number of sites or anything. Absolute number of uh, each of these quantities is is what you'll need, um, which saves you some of the math that you had to do uh, when you were doing the NDS. Um, and then you'll essentially get this table, this nice table out of uh, these calculations. And so to get the, these quantities, the data that you'll usually need are at least two sequences of your gene of interest from your population of interest. That's going to allow you to assess polymorphism. So if I was interested in, say, the Cas9 gene in E. coli, I might get a couple of E. coli strains. Right, and look at all the polymorphisms between those strains in Cas9. And then I'll need one or more sequences from an outgroup um, to compare against for looking for fixed differences. So maybe I'll take um, like a Salmonella strain or something, maybe something a little bit closer to E. coli. Um, right, and then you can run the test. And so like I was saying, you can take these um, the polymorphism data, so these Ps, and use them as your null expectation to compare your divergence data these Ps. Right? And in, in essence, how you're going to do this is you're going to put these numbers into a table and just do a test for independence. And so you can do a chi-squared test. Um, oftentimes, you won't have a whole lot of polymorphism data, especially if you don't have that many sequences. And so you might want to do something like Fisher's exact test, which deals better with um, low count cells. Um, and that's basically the test. Um, so it's actually quite simple to run. Um, there are some cases where the MK test will fail. Um, I don't talk about uh, 
demographic issues here, but if you have strong demographic changes in your population that you expect to have happened recently, um, you may want to be a little bit more careful. Um, most population tests are kind of assuming uh, constant demography over time. Um, so if you if you suspect that your population had a recent bottleneck, I'd be very careful in applying these tests. Um, but also, um, similar to DNDS, you're still going to sometimes get um, the MK test failing to detect positive selection. Um, and that's um, if weak selection, weak and negative selection, or purifying selection is affecting your gene. Strong purifying selection actually won't affect the MK test, uh, but weak purifying selection can. Um, and there are a number of methodological approaches to correct for this. Um, they all kind of have a similar intuition to them, which is that weak purifying selection um, will keep alleles that are under weak purifying selection are probably going to be kept at low frequency. And by removing those low frequency alleles, you're essentially removing the effect of weak negative selection that is confounding your inference of positive selection. And so the simplest thing to do, um, so the Faye, Wyckoff, and Wu correction, is just to remove like about 15%, you're the lowest, anything that's under 15% um, in terms of allele frequency, and then just do your MK test. Um, and we'll, I'll show you how to do that in a minute um, when we go into the tutorial portion of the, the lesson. Um, there's various more complex ways of doing this, um, and they're implemented in this package and uh, kind of web app that I'll show you later um, that I think is probably one of the easier ways to implement the MK test. Um, yeah, and then, Finally, I guess the last two things I want to talk about very briefly um, is that if you want to compare between genes, um, you don't want to just compare p-values. P-values don't tell you anything about effect size, right? So if you get one gene has more significant positive selection than another gene, that doesn't tell you about the amount of positive selection. You just might have had more polymorphism. You might have more data for that gene, for example, right? And that's not saying that's not the same thing as different strengths of selection. So if you actually want to compare strength of selection, you need a test statistic that will do that for you. Um, so the neutrality index is one that's, that's frequently used. Basically, if neutrality index is, is using those quantities I showed you before, if it's above one, that's evidence for positive selection. If it's below one, that's evidence for purifying or negative selection. Um, and the degree in which it's above or below one uh, kind of gives you the strength of selection. Oftentimes, people will log transform this um, so that it's Kind of equal in the negative and positive directions. So a negative one and a positive one kind of mean the same thing in terms of strength. Um, you have to be really careful with the neutrality index because if you have zeros for any of these quantities, um, it doesn't behave well. In general, when you're taking a ratio of ratios, it's not, it can be, you can get wonky stuff. And so you just want to be a little bit careful that you have kind of small values, you might get weird outcomes. Um, another thing that people often look at is alpha which is just one minus the neutrality index. Um, and this can be interpreted as the proportion of non-synonymous substitutions that are being fixed by positive selection. So it's kind of a convenient way of quantifying positive selection. Alpha isn't actually a, always a ratio. Um, you can have negative alpha values and that can get weird. Um, Matt Hound's Popchin book goes into that a little bit, but there's also um, this paper that talks a little bit about um, if, you, if you want to do this genome-wide, you have to average alpha with a, a correction factor and, and that's in this paper if you want to, if you have interest in that. Um, and so that is actually the extent of this lecture portion. I like to keep these classes relatively short. So I'll take some questions now. Did I not record any of that? No, I, I did record it. Good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a little weird. So I'll take some questions now and then we can go into the practical portion. Uh, after that. So if anyone has questions right now, please feel free to ask. Okay, cool. So I guess I was either very clear, clear or everyone is extremely confused. Um, so I'm going to share a different screen. Share that. Great. So does everyone see my MK test HTML lesson? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, wonderful. All right, and so I have made this uh, our markdown um, format. Those who do the um, 
network science lessons will be familiar with this format because we all we've been using this format consistently. Um, but I'm going to kind of intersperse uh, text about kind of what I'm doing with code. Um, there is a lot more bash scripting in this lesson just because um, it was a bit of a pain to get the MK test to work. Um, so why don't we, I'm going to be using this R package. Um, why is it not letting me, there we go. Um, called IMKT, which has this nice web app as well. Um, so um, you can click on this MKT analysis page. And basically, um, they're going to ask you, you can input like a, a FASTA file with your alignment, aligned gene, and it'll basically run these different, the standard MPT test and the say work off blue correction and then several other corrections um, for you. They are pretty well documented um, in terms of like what these tests, what these different corrections mean and how to use the package. Um, they also have an R package that I'll show you how to use today. Um, that's very nice. And so I prefer to use the R package just because running things locally will allow me to run it, um, kind of scale it to many genes. Um, and so going back to the lesson, um, I'm, I've essentially downloaded um, a multiple alignment of like over a thousand genes from uh, Listeria um, from the ATGC database. Um, they don't output the data in a particularly useful way for me. Um, so I have some helper scripts that will essentially reorganize this data into single gene alignments for you. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you get the correct input for the IMKT package. Um, so this is actually kind of a pain, and I'm sorry for this. But if, if anyone has an easier way to do the, the MK test, please. Um, feel free to post it on the Slack. But um, IMKT requires a very specific type of input. So you can upload a, a multiple alignment directly to their website, and they'll deal with it for you. But if you want to do stuff locally, you have to put it in this very specific um, kind of very variance table format. And they have a Python script that will do this for you. It's in Python 2. Um, so. Um, you have to have Python 2 on your computer, and they also require the pandas and PyFadeX modules for Python. And so then it'll output these two, uh, this DAF and DIV files that you'll input into the R package. Um, unfortunately, there seems to be a, a disagreement between their script and the um, format that the R package actually wants. And so you'll have to reorder a couple columns. Um, I've given you the off commands to do that. That'll kind of reformat your columns in the appropriate way. Um, and so this is all bash scripting up until this part of the lesson. And then we enter some of the R code. Um, and so you'll install your packages. Um, you'll just load these DAF and div files into R as data frames. Um, and then the actual command to run the MK test is very easy. You just do standard MKT. And you input these two files. Um, you can do fame wipe off woo correction. Uh, you basically specify the cutoff you want, and then this is the, this is the same thing. Um, and then I'm last just going to take you through doing an, an automated genome wide scan uh, where we take all of our alignments. We're going to do kind of that bash script loop. Um, of what we did before, where we run the Python script, re reorganize the code, remove some intermediate files, and then we'll load these repeatedly into R and run our test. Uh, because we only have about four sequences from our population, most of these tests will actually fail um, because we don't have enough polymorphism data. But we do have enough data for some genes to actually run the test effectively. Um, and in the end, we're going to look at kind of our our correction with and without the, we'll look at the MK test with and without the paywalk off loop correction um, and see kind of how many positively selected genes we get. Um, and then you can output these into tables. And so that kind of, this is an example of how you might do this test. Um, it's a little bit fiddly to get IMKT to work. Um, and so 
Um, if you do want to use that program locally, I do recommend reading the tutorial. Otherwise, you can just upload your alignment in the proper format to their website. Um, I will note that you need at least four sequences to assess polymorphism, as well as one outgroup, and that outgroup must be the last entry in your alignment. So it's a FASTA alignment, um, where you look at each row, and then the fifth row has to be, or the fifth, or the whatever the last row is, if you have more polymorphism data, has to be your. Um, that's the tutorial. Um, I think I uploaded this to the Git, but if I haven't, it will be up soon um, with links. Um, and again, I'll take any questions now if people have any questions. Hey, Jake. Um, what exactly? What exactly is in the DAF and the DIV files? Yeah. Um, so uh, basically, it's your it's those quantities I showed you earlier, um, but broken down a little bit differently. And so you can think about. Um, I have to actually go and look. I think M might just be your polymorphisms, but I'd have to look again. So this is essentially looking at your um, synonymous and non-synonymous um, polymorphism and fixed differences in your div file, I think. And then in your DAF file, because of some of the, how the corrections in, in this program work, when you're removing, say, allele frequency, alleles that have a frequency less than 15%, you actually need, if you want to have different cutoffs, you actually need to have your whole allele frequency distribution calculated. So you need to have your allele frequency along with your, um, your polymorphic sites um, that are synonymous and non-synonymous broken down um, at each frequency so that you can essentially cut out frequencies below that um, later when you do the baby wake-up correction or take into account this entire distribution if you're doing some of the other corrections. So this is actually what's in those files. Um, so it's essentially just a summary of the, the polymorphism and divergence in your file. That makes sense? Yep, thank you. Yep. So just, just to clarify, in the, in the web interface for IMKT, whenever, when you provide the multi-FASTA file, mm -hmm. the last sequenced mm -hmm. in that multi-FASTA file needs to be the outgroup. That's yes. sort of used to assess the fixed differences, and then yes. everything else is used for polymorphism. Yes. OK. There are ways to run the MK tests where you have polymorphism in multiple species that you're comparing. Um, but I do not believe that IMKT has that capability um, in kind of its raw form. It may, there may be special features that allow that, um, but I don't think that's that's true. Yeah. Is there a certain rate? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, OK. Oh, no, you, you, um, I was yeah. just going to add. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> All right, so on the uh, web app, you can only do one gene at a time, right? Um, I believe there's a feature to do to have a multi locus file. Ah, OK. Um, I am not sure how they want that file formatted. Um, I think. He, to run things like the asymptotic MKT, I think you need multiple loci. Um, and so if you want, if you're interested in running that test, I'd, run a little, I'd read more about their, their documentation. Um, I personally like the control of having it all on my computer in a script, um, but that may actually be more difficult than, than just doing it through their interface, actually. I was just going to ask if, uh, so for just straight DNDS analysis, you want to be in a certain range of divergence. Mm -hmm. Does that same range apply for the MKT test? I would say I have not specifically read anything about cutoffs, but I would say it almost certainly should be around the same range because you're essentially making the same calculation as you would in the DNDS mm -hmm. type test, right? You're, you're looking at the reason you don't want to be overly diverged is because you don't want saturation, presumably, and you want to be able to align your sequence as well. Uh, and then if you're too close, then you essentially won't have enough, poly you won't have enough divergence to calculate the test, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you probably want to be in that same sweet spot 
um, for the MK test. It seems like it would be more be more sensitive towards detecting differences over short divergence times compared to DNGS because you have a lot more sequences that you deal with rather than just two pairwise in the pairwise comparison. It's true, but you're going to still be limited by how far away your diverge sequence is, right? So the, the polymorphism data is going to certainly make it more sensitive. Um, but if you don't have fixed differences, then you're kind of, you just don't have fixed differences, right? So you need to still have some fixed differences to be thrown in the test. Um, but perhaps it does better with fewer, yeah. Great. <clears throat> all right. Um, I will hopefully get this to Ben today. And thank you all for joining. Um, cool. So the the markdown script will be available on. Um, are you going to clone that into the main group repository? Yeah, well, I realized we, I didn't realize we had one because I, I just saw your binder one last week. So I, it currently is sitting in the GitHub, I realized, but it's in a, its own folder as a separate repository. So I think I'm going to, I guess, I delete that repository and then just put the folder into the, uh, okay. the other one. Um, and does that include the sample sequence data that you used for your example? Does. Yeah. Okay, good. So it should be able to, you should be able to just run it all yourself. Um, Great. So, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Thanks, all. Um, see you later. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jake.